Well, it's going to be a nice intimate atmosphere, so don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, interrupt me whenever you can. Um, I prefer to answer questions during the talk rather than make you wait until the end so that we can dis discuss things, like if you have some doubts about us or, or, or whatever. Um, so this is just a, like a concept, an idea. We're building a UI for this, and we'll, we're building tools that let you leverage this. Um, essentially, so I'm Bruno, and if you want to link up, you can always reach me at these links. I will always try to answer your questions or, or um, you know, join, please let's not make it a call, but you know, emails and messages, whatever. If you need help implementing this or, or discussing ideas, I'm always at your disposal. So I'm the lead at Remark, RMRK, and we came up with five merged finalized ERCs for NFTs 2.0 that are now being implemented across the board. Um, and so it just so happens that these standards r work really well for reputation in DAOs, among many other things. So, and why is this important? Because currently the governance is kind of, you know, like, like garbage uh, in, in every DAO. You have three major types. You have no governance at all, where people just argue on Telegram mostly, uh, or, or, or Gitter, or whatever Ethereum non-governance happens now. And after a lot of arguing, something starts moving, and then you need to hurt people, then you need to you know, ask them to come somewhere or do something, and it's quite chaotic. Uh, it works, but it's quite chaotic. Do you have unenforceable token voting, which is what Snapshot does right now, and this is cute, but it's little more than online polling. It has the same effectiveness as a Twitter poll, because the developers can just say, no, nah, we're not gonna do that. It doesn't matter what you voted for, we're just not gonna do that. And then there's auto-enforceable token voting, where once something is voted in, that code automatically executes. This happens on substrate chains, this happens in some smart contract protocols, where they upload the new smart contract and the proxy is voted in. Um, but this is kind of the most productive type of governance, because you can't escape a decision. Now, um, let's roll back here and talk about NFTs a little bit. So NFTs 1.0 are just static art that doesn't really do much and um, it's never going to do much. And if you want to change them in any way or evolve them, you have to rely on what everybody does right now, which is centralized metadata, which is manually updated at the whim of the developers, either through the admin function in smart contract or the centralized server, which is holding the metadata. Um, enter NFTs 2.0, which we've kind of built as a backwards compatibility layer on top of this, where you essentially have an NFT that can have different assets for outputs. So the first ERC, well, it says EIP here because this was written when it was still ERC, but uh, EIP. Uh, the first ERC is 5773, which allows an NFT to have multiple different outputs at the same time for the same NFT. This has many benefits, among, um, am among them the prevention of airdrop spam, for example. When you have an avatar that's popular today or an, or an NFT, um, the team behind it does not have to spam you with an alternative model or illustration in your wallet and ultimately leads to a disconnected experience where these NFTs are then separate and you can sell them separately and it just leads to spam. Instead, they can add a new asset, a new type of output into the same NFT itself. So it's part of the same NFT. It's like looking at the, that, that face that has multiple expressions from different sides, right? And the owner of that NFT always has the ability to pick the priority asset that they want displayed on marketplaces. So if I like this one more to be shown on OpenSea, I'll just pick this one. And it just works, right? So I'll just pick this one, and now this one is the primary, but those other two are still accessible. This also solves the problem, the age-old problem of gamers hating NFTs, because they say you can't just take a Counter-Strike counter skin into, I don't know, Fortnite, because they're the different engine, different fidelity, different resolution, different texture, everything. Now you can. You can have one file that's optimized for Fortnite and one file that's done for Counter-Strike, one file that's done for Minecraft, doesn't matter. It all works in the same NFT. That's really, really cool because it allows you to actually have NFTs that can be moved between games without centralization in between, without middlemen. Um, then we come to the other two EAPs that are important here. Nestable, which allows an NFT con to contain other NFTs, and Equipable, which allows you to define slots in a parent NFT and define which assets, which assets of an NFT are compatible with which slot in the parent. So what does this lead to? You have an NFT that can contain other NFTs. These are all separate NFTs. Um, if you have a head slot for your lobster here, then you can equip a hat on its head. 
and you can change which one you want to equip, right? So you have different hats inside the NFT, and you can equip one of these hats, right? Cool stuff. But what happens if my priority asset is the voxelated one? Now, the art style doesn't really match it, and you can't really expect this to fit on this one. It's going to look weird. This is the skin compatibility problem from games, right? You can't really equip a Minecraft axe onto a Fortnite character. It's not going to look good. Um, but since these are also NFTs, and they are just as compatible with everything as everything else launched on these standards, so they're also 5773, uh, this means that the hat can also have its own voxel version. And now you define that the voxel asset of this hat is compatible with the voxel head slot of this lobster, which means that now the lobster can actually equip the voxel hat. And now the styles match. These are not compatible because they're not voxel assets, but this one is. And so now, what if there's a new collection from a completely unrelated creator that is visually completely unrelated, a stained glass window, right? None of these hats look good on this stained glass window. Again, we have a new asset. We add a new asset into the NFT. We define that it's compatible with this collection and that it has this asset which is compatible with this collection. And now we can put this hat into the collection so it fits, it artistically matches, you know? And uh, the good thing here is that these NFTs, these standards are future compatible, the future proof. Whatever comes out in the future is automatically compatible with everything that's been published in the past, and everything that gets published with these standards is automatically mutually compatible. You don't have to know the developer with whose project you're adding compatibility. You don't have to arrange things in advance, and you don't have to customize your entire stack or UI or whatever for this to work. It automatically works out of the box for every collection you launch with this. And it's backwards compatible with um, ERC721. Now, the final piece of this puzzle is um, ERC6454, which is the minimalistic soulbound interface. And now, um, this allows you, since our NFTs can hold other NFTs, and the soulbound NFT is bound to, usually bound to a wallet or an account, it, it makes sense to be able to bind it to another NFT as well. And so now you can lock an NFT inside another NFT, which is reputation. So, of course, this is obviously very good for gaming because a game character, a game avatar can collect experience, which is basically what this is. They can collect soulbound items, which is, again, what this is. But they can also collect tradable equipables that they can equip and trade with others. In this case, let's assume that there are three projects, uh, Yearn, Coinbase, and Jumper Exchange. And now they all have some tasks that you can do for them as ambassadors, let's say. And uh, let's say that this task is purely reputational, but this one is reputational and comes with a bonus equipable. So if you do this task for them, you will get this reputational badge into your NFT, and you will get this equipable to equip on your NFT, which means you get some fancy swag to show off, but also reputation. Now, why is this useful? Because if I do some tasks for these projects, I can, add, I can get three reputations and two different equipables. Let's say I did all of these tasks. And now I can somebody else can do something else. So this guy, that other guy, did two other tasks and got a different equipable. And now maybe I like his hat, he likes my hat, we can trade these equipables. These are two unrelated NFT collections which have now earned compatible equipables. And we now created a creator and collector market on top of the reputational market of all of these projects. So in a way, Right now, when you launch a new NFT collection, you're entering a vampire attack war with everybody else. You're attacking everybody else's community. Your goal is to take their collectors, their users, to add to yours. Your goal is to make your community stronger at the cost of somebody else. This way, no. This way, you are part of the tide that rises all boats. You are part of this global item economy where everybody who launches anything into these standards is immediately compatible with everybody else. This means it, this lets you tap into existing communities from other projects and you know, people might ask, ooh, where'd you get that cool hat? Well, I did this tutorial for Yearn. Ooh, I'm gonna do this tutorial for Yearn. Boom, you know, player inherited. And this is compatible with games, with DAOs, with, with everything you want. So now you have this gamified reputation collecting with an earning mechanism on top. You can sell these equipables, the project itself can earn royalties from these equipables, and the artist can also earn royalties from these. And now we come to the kind of actually utility of the reputation, and this is in a simplified way, but it works. 
So let's say that Jumper has decided to apply 10 points to this task, 5 to this one, 30 to this one, and so on. Let's say that Coinbase dislikes Jumper so much that they will apply minus 5 to you if you do this task for them. And so now you come to this project war of loyalty and reputation, where everybody can assign different point values to some reputational aspects and grant you certain perks based on your reputation. Maybe you have access to a new beta UI. Maybe you have access to a special event. Maybe you have access to some mints that you wouldn't have access to before. Maybe you have better yield rates. Who knows? Um, and so th this is extremely simplified because it's just numeric but it can also be purely categorized. So you can have a category of tutorials into which you collected points, and a protocol can just read that directly from your NFT and check, all right, this guy has five tutorial reputations earned. This guy did almost all of our tutorials. Let's give him this and this perk and advantage, right? So what do these reputational avatars actually offer you? Well, they offer you access gating by reputation, so you can prevent access to a channel or something based on reputation that people have. They offer whale resistance, because now plutocracy no longer matters. If you have a system in which the richest person has the most votes and money equals votes, then that person, especially if it's a staking system, can only become richer and you will never be able to catch up with them because they have a fat stack. They can vote with this fat stack and his votes are continuously forever growing. That's no good. But if you have reputation where everybody, even the whales, start from zero, level zero, then anybody can catch up to them. Additionally, if you implement decay of reputation, if you skip too many proposals, if you're idle too long, your reputation can decay and indicate that you have not been active. Somebody who is active, who's young and naive and energetic and wants to participate in the project, they will catch up to a whale. And so now your, your DAO is no longer captured by the whales. And now your DAO is no longer going to fall apart when the bear market comes and greed kicks in. Instead, there's going to be a new flood of very energetic new users who will want to fix things and who will fight to earn this reputation, which is automatic from the chain. This is a human minimized system because you attach reputation mints to certain actions in the protocol that you can do. If I mint this much collateral, then I get this reputation. You can add these um, automatic reputation earners into your protocol and remove humans from this equation. Later on, you can use the reputation humans have acquired to actually influence that reputation further. So um, it does need some game theory, it does need some tweaking, but it's a very interesting experiment in whale resistance. There's a zero-sum game resistance where you have this global item economy. Every new project launching on this will contribute to every other new project. There's this gamification of participation, which many people are suckers for, including me. If you gamify any kind of participation in a project, I'm the first one there. And you also have the ability to have NFTs as accounts. Your NFT then starts acting as your account, as your proof of participation in a project, in a protocol, in an ecosystem, and so on. And you can then log in with your NFT, you can use it as your wallet, you can do whatever you want, what you would usually be doing, but your NFT represents you, your participation in this project, in this ecosystem. Um, some examples of people using this in production, Blossom Land is launching very soon. They're kind of building this work-based reputation for Web3 participants, which means that if you were really good at some sort of event and organizing food, the organization behind it can give you the reputation of being an excellent food organizer at this event. And they, so the, here, the projects mint your reputation into your profile, and there are deposits involved and some game theory to prevent gaming it, but it's a very interesting experiment in persistent reputation based on your actions off-chain and on-chain. So this is launching soon, keep an eye on it. Um, Crescent Codex is our mint as a kind of an inaugural mint for uh, launching on the Moonbeam chain. We minted these um, moon-themed NFTs that go into the... So the Codex is a parent NFT and moon phases go inside it. You earn these moon phases based on your actions in the marketplace. And then there's the Lobster Dog Food DAO, which is being built as a system for um, projects to pay others to dog food their protocol, which means that if you're building a protocol, you have direct access to a pool of DeFi founders and DGENs who will battle test your protocol and report feedback for reputation and incentivization in the DAO itself. And the DAO pays them to do this as well, because there's a lobster DAO treasury and so on. So it's, yeah. Um, if you want to get started with any of this, all the ERCs I mentioned are on evm.rmrk.app. They're final and they're ready to be used, they're in production. Um, 
any, any NFT that you mint with this is visible in a rudimentary form on OpenSea. But if you want to see the full functionality of it, if you want to test, if you want to check out the, equip, the equipable, the sending NFTs into other NFTs, um, all that magic stuff, you can go to singular.app um, and there you're going to see the full functionality of, of Remark NFTs, of NFTs 2.0. Um, and yeah, that's, that's it. So singular.app, singular.app is the marketplace. I don't have the link here, but oh yeah, there it is. So singular.app will have the NFTs to play with, but in general, you can just play with the contracts directly and read this. And there's a short breakdown about Soulbound Tokens 2, which is sbt2.io, um, or just evm.armrk app. So uh, time is, all right, we have like five minutes for questions, if anybody has any questions. This is live and ready for use. Yeah, it's in production. We launched Ethereum support last night. You can use it on Ethereum. Polygon is coming next week. We are live on Moonbeam, and other EVMs are coming soon. That's exactly what it's for, yeah. So you can, uh, so it, like uh, we started this in the Polkadot ecosystem where you have a lot of things to do on chain. So Polkadot has this on chain governance, it has delegation, it has treasury voting, it has treasury tips that you can vote on. It has, you, people can do a lot of things on chain, including runtime upgrades, voting for those, all of that stuff. And so this was really easy to track on chain and convert directly into NFTs. Uh, but this is applicable to any protocol out there. Yeah, now it's an EVM, now it's EVM, exactly. Now it's EVM contracts, you can just take our implementation, use it, and run with it. So the SBTs are implemented specifically with this uh, ERC6454, we just overwrite the transfer function, but bind it to another NFT. So you can, you can read in this, but we also, yeah, 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 so it, they're just non-transferable, but they are non-transferable to their immediate context. So if you put it into an NFT and make it non-transferable, it cannot be moved out of that NFT. But the parent NFT, if it's transferable, will move the soul bond with it. So it's like, so it's like, a, you know, like a, like a metal cabinet, like a trophy cabinet. The trophies can't be put out, but you can move the cabinet. So, um, so account abstraction just has a list of functions you need for to make a to make a smart contract into a wallet, and if you just plug those functions into our contracts, they are they are that. So it already works. The problem is right now of the full implementation of what we have as example implementation of our contracts is a bit too big, so it would have to be split out into a separate contract that's linked in. Um, so it's a little, it's a size issue right now, but it can be squeezed in and it already works. In fact, uh, we first presented this concept to ZK Sync, who have been working on a native account abstraction thing, which, can, which we can do without having to add new functions into the thing, so that it can really be an actual account on the network. Um, but yes, this was originally envisioned as part of account abstraction, so you can actually use it as an actual account, yeah. yeah. Did, you, did you mention you were building a UI? Yeah, so the UI is actually singular.app as the marketplace on which you can mint all this, but there's going to be a special UI on sbt2.io or attestations.io where you can uh, mint these specific um, DAO-specific collections for this exact purpose that I mentioned. Not for voting or anything? Yeah, there is, so there is going to be some voting mechanics, some voting primitives you can plug in. Like, for example, there's this concept of... Um, semi-bound that we're playing with, where a lot of people ask, like, what if I accrue a lot of reputation and then lose access to my wallet? And it's non-transferable, right? And so the semi-bound concept is, uh, if you, you, when you're setting up the collection, you can set up certain thresholds. And if all the other people who have that reputational avatar vote to make that NFT movable once, that NFT, even though it's non-transferable, will become transferable just once. But in order to propose the movement of that, you need to put down a deposit. So you can come in as a total stranger, say, all right, here's 500 die, 
uh, I propose moving this to my wallet, and then you argue your case. And then everybody else with the reputation from that same ecosystem can vote yes or no. It's like the same reason why Bitcoin has value, because a lot of people who have it think it has value. This is the same thing, right? So if a lot of people with a non-transferable token start believing that one should be transferred once, we'll allow it to be transferred once for the sake of backup and restoration of the account. So there are some primitives we'll put in there, but mainly it's envisioned as kind of a layer on top of existing DAO voting mechanics that you can implement from before. So you have, if you have like a voting engine that you want to plug in, it should be compatible with it, and you can just plug reputa reputation on top to add more value. It's got to be a custom census. Uh, it, it can, yeah, it can be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the limit is, I think, the array length of Solidity. So it's not, it's not any practical limit. There's not going to be any practical. Additionally, I forgot to mention, every change you want to do to any NFT is always a multi-sig operation between the owner and issuer, which means that if you have an NFT and you want to add a new asset to it, you, as the collection issuer, need to propose it to the holder, and the holder needs to accept it. The holder cannot add new assets into his NFT. So this prevents the collection owner from rug pulling your art and replacing all the bored apes with Coca-Cola ads or something. And this prevents the owner from just adding new art into his NFT and corrupting the NFT. You know? So it's a two, two of two operation always in these cases. The same goes for children. If you want to add an NFT into an NFT you do not own, that NFT you're sending goes into a pending array. And so the owner has to accept the child. This prevents somebody from spamming your board ape with swastikas or something when you're trying to sell it, you know? So there are mechanisms that prevent this uh, aspect. They are overridable. You can replace them with your own implementation, but our default implementation does this. Yeah. That's it? That's it. All right, thank you very much.